And it's now my great pleasure to introduce and reintroduce Marcus de Sotoy, because like Etel Adnan, he has participated in uh, seven marathons and always given us new, very unexpected perspectives on mathematics. And obviously, transformation mathematics are deeply, deeply uh, connected, such is the history of the marathon uh, and Marcus. Marcus is the Simoni Professor for the Public Understanding of Science and Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. He's the author of several books, The Music of the Primes, Finding Moonshine, and most recently, The Number Mysteries. His work has inspired many artists. We collaborated with him um, at the Serpentine when Julia Peyton Johns and I invited him to write a text on Gerhard Richter's uh, 4,000 900 colors, and Marcus has presented many, many radio and TV series on science, such as the landmark TV series for the BBC called The Story of Mass. More recently, he has written and performed a play called X and Y, which has been staged in London Science Museum and also at the Glastonbury Festival. Marcus will be giving an interactive talk today titled Granada, Goldberg and Ghosts, Granada, Goldberg and Ghosts. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Marcus de Sotoy. Well, I always enjoy this time of year. Uh, it's waiting for Hans Ulrich's email about um, what the word this year will be. It's a little bit like uh, in Oxford, uh, we have a college, All Souls College, uh, where we have this prize fellowship exam, and the candidates are all given one word, the same one word, and they have to write for three hours on this one word. So it always feels a little bit, don't worry, I'm not going to be talking for three hours. So, um, um, But it was interesting, because this year, as I turned over my examination paper and saw the word transformation, Actually, it went really to the heart of what I do as a mathematician. Um, my area of research is um, trying to understand um, the world of symmetry. And uh, for centuries, mathematicians found it very hard to kind of get to grips with quite a slippery concept of what symmetry really is. I think most of us have a concept of, yeah, sure, left-right reflectional symmetry. Um, but it turns out it goes uh, much deeper than that. And actually, it's this word transformation um, that gave us the key, the language, uh, literally, to be able to take the geometry into algebra and sort of understand for what symmetry really means. So what I wanted to do with you today was to, to take you on a sort of tour to try and help you understand how I use the word transformation to understand uh, the mathematics of symmetry. And one of the best places I thought I could take you on this tour was to kick off in um, Granada. Because um, Granada, for me, is just uh, where I want to end up. If I, had to, I was banished to one place in the world and I had to spend my life there, I think Granada is a kind of palace. The Alhambra is a palace celebrating the world of symmetry. As soon as you go in there, actually, there's lots of water, so you get this left-right reflectional symmetry. But it's those tiles on the wall that just thrill me and make me want to try and to, to read these walls and understand the symmetry that the Moorish artists are putting up here. Um, so this is what I want to try and uh, unlock for you, how to read the walls in the Alhambra and the symmetry there, how to understand when walls have the same symmetry, yet they look very different. And it's this word transformation which is key. It's interesting because uh, when I talk to a lot of artists, for them, symmetry um, is something actually rather rather deathly. Uh, if you talk to Thomas Mann, for example, in The Magic Mountain, um, he has uh, one of the characters, his ca principal character, stuck out in the this snow blizzard, describing the snowflakes, the symmetry of the snowflake. Um, he said he shuddered at its perfect precision, found it deathly, the very marrow of death. But for me as a mathematician, it's, it's almost the opposite. For me, symmetry, although it looks very still and deadly, actually has hiding underneath it a lot of action movement. And it's this word transformation which allows you to understand that although there's stillness there underlying there, there's a lot of movement. And the person who really made the breakthrough to, to unlock how to read the walls in the Alhambra is this is guy here, Every Galwa. He's kind of my, my hero uh, in the world of mathematics. Um, he's a young revolutionary at the um, uh, 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 beginning of the 19th century. Um, he gets killed in a duel at the age of 20 over love and politics. But before that, while still at school, he 
created this new language, which I call group theory, which allows us to understand um, how to read these walls in the Alhambra. He's actually the, um, the main protagonist at the heart of this book, Finding Moonshine, my second book, which is all about trying to unlock this world of symmetry. And for Galois, symmetry was all about what are the things that you can do to an object? You move it somehow, such that when you put it back down again, it looks like it was before you moved it. Um, so, for example, if you take a football, what are the ways you know, it's covered in pentagons and hexagons? What can I do to that football? What moves can I make? What transformations can I make? Such that when I put the football back down again, it looks like it hadn't moved at all. So symmetry is a bit like what I call the magic trick moves. You know, you close your eyes, I do something, you open them, you can't see how it changed. Um, so the way to read the walls in the Alhambra is to take the tiles and ask what moves, what transformations can I make to those tiles such that when I put them back down again, it looks like I hadn't moved them at all. And it's by understanding all of the moves that you can make in these walls in the Alhambra that you begin to understand how to read um, the symmetry hiding behind them. So for example, if you go to the, um, the Alhambra, you'll find these two different walls tiled. Um, they look very different. There was one, these lovely shimmering triangles, kind of like triangles in the Andalusian uh, heat shimmering there. And then you've got this very rigid sort of, sort of structure with a six-pointed star. But if you start to use this language of transformation, you understand that these are actually examples of the same underlying symmetries. Because what are the magic trick moves? What are the things I can do to this wall? Well, I can rotate them by a sixth of a turn around the point um, where all of the three or six triangles meet, and they all sit back down on top of each other. But there's another point. In the middle of those triangles, I can rotate by a third of a turn, and they place down. So two different transformations I can make to this wall. But there's another hit, like, quite hard one to find. If you take halfway along, the tiles and rotate them by 180 degrees, half a turn, then you get them matching up on top of each other. So these are the three key transformations which describe the symmetries of this wall. But if you now go to this other structure with these kind of Z figures and the six-pointed star, you've got the three same transformations. A heart of the six-pointed star you can rotate by a sixth of a turn. Where the Z pieces meet, there's a third of a turn you can make such that everything matches up after the transformation. And then the hard place to find is the halfway between the six pointed stars, you have to rotate the whole tiles by half a turn and then they lock down on top of each other. So for me, this is the moment when I actually, it's a bit like when humans suddenly understood how to count. You know, I've got three people here on three chairs, but the three chairs are very different from the three people, yet this underlying idea of the abstract number of three is common to both of them. And this word transformation allowed us to see these walls and understand, although they're both very different, actually the symmetry, the abstract symmetry underlying them is the same. Here are two diff three different um, walls. This, when you enter the palace in the Alhambra, um, you see this on the wall and the floor and the ceiling. Um, these both, all three p pictures look very different, but using this word transformation, I can understand that they have the same underlying symmetry. There's uh, a point where a quarter of a turn, two points for the quarter of a turn, and a half a turn. So we call this 442, which has nothing to do with football, but just because there's um, these points, 4, 4, and 2, that we can rotate these. So now I can say, although these look very different, they have the same underlying symmetry. And using this language, at the end of the 19th century, um, mathematicians are able to understand that in the walls in the Alhambra, although there are many different um, physical realizations, actually this language allowed us to say, actually there are only 17 different possible ways that you can uh, tile symmetrically the walls in the Alhambra. These are like two-dimensional crystals. Uh, we've understood now three-dimensional crystals, there are many more different ways, but what about four, five, six? I spend my life kind of in very high dimensional sort of crystal world trying to understand what, how I can sort of tile a sort of multi-dimensional Alhambra palace. Um, so for me, this, uh, at the first sight, this looks very static and still, but I can see a lot of movement and transformation in there. But the same idea is actually used um, to cause transformation in time, um, but not on the walls in the Alhambra, but in music. So for example, if you take something like the Goldberg variations, I would say the Goldberg variations by Bach is a little bit like the, the, the musical version of the Alhambra. This is again a kind of celebration of the world of symmetry. The Goldberg variations actually were created to put uh, somebody to sleep, but um, I, I don't think they work, really. Um, so they start, actually, with an aria, which defines the kind of first seed that you're going to start to transform. The aria um, gets played at the beginning and also gets played at the end. So it already gives a sense of a symmetrical structure at the heart of the Goldberg variations, which is the circle. Um, 
uh, and then the transformations that Bach starts to make on this theme um, appear already by the third variation. The third vari so here's the aria just to kick us off with what we're going to be transforming. So every third variation after that is an example of something called a canon. So you probably remember what a canon is um, from school. It's those songs that you sing where somebody starts off, and then a little bit later, the same somebody else starts off singing the same thing, but delayed in time. So every third variation is one of these canons. And we see this transformation, which causes this magical effect. The same voice moved. It's a bit like repeating the tile a little bit later. But now you hear the transformation in time, rather than just in physical space. Um, so here we hear the first variation, uh, or the first canon, which is the third variation. So listen for the, the theme, the, like the tile being transformed and repeating itself. And now it comes. So it transforms and magically fits on top. But Bach isn't content with just repeating the second voice. So by the time you come to the second canon, the sixth variation, he starts to transform in another direction as well. Not only is he moving the tiles this way, he's also moving them up as well. So the second voice starts a note higher. And the second voice starts one note higher. So as you move through the canons, these vo the second voice gets moved and transformed further and further up until something rather magical happens when you hit the eighth canon, the 24th variation, because at that point, suddenly, the second voice is an octave higher, and it seems to join the thing back up again, um, because the octave almost sounds like this. We give it the same uh, name because it's almost like the same note. Um, and so you get a sort of uh, rejoining of the circle with this second transformation. It's as if the walls are suddenly wrapped round. Um, so let's hear that one. So it's a lower one, it's actually an octave lower. So Bach has actually created a shape here. He's created with a circle of the variations going from aria from one side to the other, but with this climbing circular shape as well. Here we hear the structure. With these transformations, he's created in this piece of music the structure of a torus. But it's not only the way he varies the piece as well, uses a lot of transformations that you're seeing in the walls in the Alhambra. Um, the reflectional symmetry, for example, is used in the 12th variation, where the, uh, the, when the voice climbs up, the second voice will climb down. So we were here, re really hear the reflectional symmetry. So I think I've sort of um, teased you a little bit with all of these variations and, and cutting them off. So I'm going to let you hear the whole of this variation, if you'll indulge me. transformations in music. Now these two ideas, the, the, um, the symmetry on the walls in the Alhambra and the, the music here actually uh, led to uh, us, uh, my, my, some work I did with Richard Rees at the Pattern Foundry that we, we actually combined these two ideas to create um, a, a new um, tile that could be used in the Alhambra. So uh, Richard, if you could bring the tiles up that we've um, got. Um, so I did, uh, one of my favorite um, images in the Alhambra is this one, the idea of this shimmering triangle. Um, but we had this idea that uh, actually these shimmering uh, uh, sides look like wavelengths. They look like vibrating waves, which will create a sound. Um, so what we thought was we'd actually vary this. So, you know, this is one note. Um, but actually, I mean, if you take 
uh, musical harmony, all of those notes that Bach was using were actually generated, which if you could stand over here, uh, let's, uh, let's do it in front here, so, um, uh, are, are basically generated, you remember I said the, the, we had this thing, the, the octave, so if I just vibrate, let's, if you keep it very still, so that's just one note, but if I vibrate it try twice as fast, let's see, then we get a note which is an octave higher, so it's half the wavelength. So we thought, well, that's um, one of the, let me try and get the next vibration. So if I do it three times as fast, is that, let's see. how many can you see there? Is that three? Yeah, it's quite difficult to do, actually. So actually, that note, if we played it, would be uh, a perfect fifth higher. And this is the ingredient for the whole of uh, music uh, across the world, that you then build these using that perfect fifth. The two to three relationship is the, the heart of all the music. So what we thought we would do was to take, well, this is like one note, but let's take the note sort of an octave higher and a perfect fifth above that. And so we put these um, waves, these musical notes, alongside um, the sides of uh, these tiles. So the one in the Alhambra is just a single note, but why not put uh, three, uh, three notes? So you put the, the, the bass note, then the octave, and then the perfect fifth above that. And what was curious is that when we did this, um, the thing actually looked rather like a ghost. So we put two little eyes on the thing, which um, only glow in the dark. And um, uh, these things here, uh, we can then put together. And it's rather remarkable that if you take um, the tiles, if you took one tile, you wouldn't believe that that would actually you know, tile a wall. I mean, how on earth is that going to fit together? Um, but if you do this, it's rather remarkable. You can put these together. So those are the, the perfect fifth. This is the, um, the octave below and the octave below that. And you get them all fitting together. So a little challenge for you. I've got some of these printed out on a piece of paper. What I want you to do to test your ability to read the walls and find the transformations is what are the points on this wall like I did before, that you can fix the wall, turn it, and everything locks down again. So I hope that you can see that even something that looks kind of like static and not alive and still, actually hidden underneath it, can still have a lot of movement, energy, and transformation. Thank you.